Frank Reich, Colts head coach, made it official. Ellinger, the guy who wanted to be Chris Sims, is now the starting quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts. Here's Reich. We are going to elevate Sam to be the starting quarterback. Extremely difficult decision, obviously, given the respect and admiration that we have for Matt Ryan and, you know, what he's done and what he's brought here. Um, you know, he is a pro's pro. This guy is, this guy is special, special, special. And, you know, we all we know right at the quarterback position that it's not our poor production on offense is not on one person. It's not on Matt Ryan. Um, but we also know, as Matt and I talked it through, hey, as head coach and quarterback, as head coach, ultimately it doesn't matter. I'm judged on wins and losses. Quarterbacks judged on points and, you know, and production and turnovers. That's we understand that's how it is in this league. And so um, Matt will be a pro. He, you know, he, I will say this. Uh, as you guys saw, or maybe saw, he did get banged up in the game. He does have a grade two, uh, grade two um, shoulder separation. This was going to be the move with whether he was healthy or not. That is true. This that we were going to, yeah. The, the shoulder injury is real, but this move was this move was going to be made uh, either way. Mr. Ursay, as I've said many times, and you guys know longer than uh, better than me because you've been here longer than me is. You got a lot of wisdom, a lot of good counsel. You know, it was, you know, we liked certainly he his vote is always going to carry. Uh, it's a one man crew in that respect. But what I appreciate about him is that this is a collective decision. Yeah, it's a collective decision. You better collectively make the decision that I want you to make. And I think Frank Reich chose his words carefully, but he sent the message loudly and clearly. This is an ownership call. Plain and simple. We'll talk about why it's an ownership call coming up. But, Chris, you know, it was so weird yesterday afternoon. Is he injured? Is he benched? What's going on here? The tr the tweets start falling out of the sky, and it's like, oh, he's injured. Oh, wait, he's benched either way, injured or healthy. Matt Ryan is done. It, it's shocking. It really is. I mean, I wasn't expecting that for a team that's, you know, 3-3-1 three, three and one and kind of battling – and again, Matt Ryan, it hasn't been pretty. We know that. I mean, we've, we've discussed this the first few weeks of the year. He looks frail. He looks weak. His arm looks weak. There's been an inability to push the ball down the field and make any game-changing power-type throws. Has he been tough as hell in the pocket, taking shots, completing seven- and eight-yard passes? Yes, without a doubt. But damn, he gets hit and drops the ball a lot. And of course, when you make decisions like this, then it's hard to get behind and defend it. And when I'm with you, Mike, to go like, yeah, I, I think ownership has a huge say in this for sure. I also think the Colts got to the, the point where they went, you know what, we're, we're not going to get better. Like the offensive line is not going to turn around. This is not going to change. We, gotta get, we have to have a different, a different approach, a different formula. Uh, I, I think they realized that this was not really sustainable, that they were going to get any better with Matt Ryan at quarterback. And I think that's probably why they make the change, too. You know, I think they realized that. And big picture of things for the Colts, if they still want to hang in this thing, it can't be we're, we're going to have our older, not mobile, weak-armed quarterback drop back and carry us 47 you know, passes a game. That's not going to work. Ellinger brings another element to the team and a little bit more pizzazz and a little bit more danger and a better arm, and he can run to where maybe he can hide some of the deficiencies of their football team, let alone make some plays like this that are off schedule that Matt Ryan is not capable of doing. At least that's my two cents, Mike. What, what do you got to say about this whole hey, thing? Hey, what's the thing that separates the great from the good that's quarterbacks right. in today's NFL? It's the ability to make the off schedule plays, the ability to run laterally, buy time, and find an open receiver or take off down the field. And Ellinger has that, and Matt Ryan doesn't. And this is why we're seeing the age – of the great older and younger quarterbacks end. Yeah. The older quarterbacks, it's over. Yeah. And they the can't older do quarterbacks anything. are the ones right. who can't do the things that make quarterbacks special today. The play that's called and then the play that evolves when the play that's called goes to hell. That's what you need to have the ability to do. Ryan doesn't have it. Brady doesn't have it. Rodgers does, but it doesn't matter in Green Bay, whatever the hell is going on Well, there. he wants to throw but, it and then, and when they're two yards down the field, so we don't even get to see what the hell they could do. But, yes. We yes, don't, we right, don't get to right. see what he would do if yeah. he had to go off schedule. Right. He's running the play that's called. Right. Um, but, you know, Chris, I look at it this way. 
we, we talked about teams that may be dog paddling toward the end of the season. The Colts were kind of dog paddling all year long. And they've decided we're either going to freestyle or we're going to sink. Yeah, right. And right. Ellinger's either going to take us to where we could be, and then we know we have our guy, and we're not doing this, hey, who's the veteran quarterback that's going to fall out of the sky and land in our lap next year? Phillip Rivers in 2020. Carson Wentz, 2021. What the hell are we going to do in 22? Oh, the, the Falcons accidentally pissed off Matt Ryan by flirting with Deshaun Watson. Oh, maybe they knew what they were doing. Uh, Matt Ryan falls in their laps. They can't keep doing that. They're either going to find a guy who they can rally around and build around and take off with, or they're going to suck and they're going to get themselves a top flight franchise quarterback in the draft like they got Peyton Manning and like they got Andrew Luck. That's, it's one or the other. They're, I think they're hoping for that outcome. We're either going to know that Ellinger's the guy or it's going to go so poorly that we are going to find ourselves in a position where we can draft the guy next year. Yeah, I, I think that's it. It's kind of it. It's kind of just like let's tear the Band-Aid off here and go and, and see. And, again, you know, I, I, I still – this situation, it's still crazy and it's still here and, and in our face with the Colts because of one thing, because Andrew Luck decided to quit football in the middle of training camp. And, I, and that's where I feel bad for Frank Reich, Chris Ballard, and the whole group here. You know, again, but the team itself, yeah, they need something. They need a little bit of a jolt, a pizzazz. And with Ellinger, like you talked about, you know, Matt Ryan, the Brady, that type of quarterback, they need a certain formula to succeed. We know that. It has to be great protection. It has to, you know, the system has to be working. They're not going to make things happen off schedule. And it's not fair to think that, that, that you know, really Matt Ryan could make it happen at this point of his career with the type of formula they have right now. So Ellinger, quarterback design runs, move them a little bit. Yes, scramble like we saw, do the things that you talked about. You know, oh, here's a gap. Let me run for 20, 30 yards. His arm is bigger. Matt Ryan, you, you, right now, it's a little bit like it was with Phillip Rivers two years ago where teams are just like, well, we don't really have to defend any past 20 yards behind us. I mean, it's kind of just come downhill all the time. So Ellinger brings that element to the team, let alone I know from this kid – He's got something about him, a little piss and vinegar in this kid. I watched him in Texas closely. He's big. He's strong. He's not afraid to lower his shoulder a little bit. You know, he thinks he's got better than he is, and he gets screwed over in the draft. So maybe they can they can invent a new way to play here on the offensive side of the ball and and be more effective with Ellinger at quarterback. I, I'm I'm hopeful. Well. Interesting for you to say he's got piss and vinegar. We have to see more home movies to see whether he was pissing off the front porch. Maybe he was here. <laughs> he was a kid. Seriously, I um, hope so. I hope so. <laughs> here's, my, here's my thought on Matt Ryan as it relates to the fact that no matter what happens to Ellinger, no matter what happens to Nick Foles, no matter what happens to anybody else they may sign to play quarterback, we will never see him again on the field for the Indianapolis Colts because of his contract. Right. Because he's got, I've got the numbers here. Next year, there's 7.2 million that's guaranteed for injury that becomes fully guaranteed the third day of the 2023 league year. And he's got a $10 million roster bonus that is guaranteed for injury that is earned on the third day of the 2023 league year. Yep. So, see ya. Here's the key. Yeah. If he has, at any point this year, you play him the rest of the season, however far they go, if he suffers any injury that prevents him from passing a physical before mid-March of 23, they're on the hook for that $17 million. They're already on the hook for 12, but another 17 goes on to the pile if he has an injury that keeps him from passing a physical in March. So here's what I think they're going to do. We got a week until the trade deadline. Nobody's going to call to trade for Matt Ryan. However, however, we don't know what's going to happen in week eight. We don't know what quarterback's going to tear an ACL. We, we, we don't know. The Carson Palmer window opened with the Raiders 11 years ago after Jason Campbell broke his collarbone two days before the trade deadline. Otherwise, Palmer wouldn't have played at all in 2011, and who knows when he would have played again. So maybe somebody is made to be sufficiently desperate that they call and they do a trade. Then it's problem solved for the Colts completely. I think we get past the trade deadline because I think the chances that happen are very slim. Yes, we get past right. the trade deadline, Chris. Yeah. They're going to cut him at some point. You think so? Once he's healthy, once he's healthy, they'll cut him. 
He'll pass through waivers, and if they cut him at the right time, let's say they just hold him until somebody has a quarterback who tears an ACL. They they cut him then. Maybe somebody claims the balance of the contract on waivers. Problem solved. But And then they have to stop paying him, right? They get somebody to take over the contract. He doesn't get that. Well, it's already guaranteed anyway, but still, you'd like someone to just take him off your hands if you put him through waivers. Or they just say, hey, look, out of respect to what you've done in the NFL, we're going to cut you and let you sit at home, work out, get ready for an opportunity that may or may not arise at some point. Whether they, when they cut him, I don't know. Maybe it's right after the trade deadline, or maybe they wait for an opportunity where they think they could get someone to claim his contract on waivers. But I think he gets cut at some point after the trade deadline, unless lightning strikes and they somehow get an opportunity to trade him between now and next Tuesday. But he's never playing for the Colts again. It's over. It's done. And that's the Jim Irsay. This is my $17 million that is going to get wasted on a guy who potentially gets an injury at some point late in his season that keeps him from passing a physical next year. Once I know he's not my guy next year, get him the hell off the field. That's the thought process that I think went into this decision. Yeah, Mike, I, I mean – I, I, I didn't really go down that lane. You know, I'm so football-oriented, but I, I think everything you you said makes sense. And, yeah, yeah, you know, when you lay it out that way, you're right. I don't expect to see him back playing for the Colts. Nick Foles will be the guy that's the backup. And, I, I mean, I, I think one step further, that's, that's really, when you think about it, like that's probably the last time we see Matt Ryan all together. I, I think that's probably it. I don't really – I don't know how anybody's going to watch film of this year and go, oh – I think he's got something left in the tank. Let's let's give him one more shot here, you know. And again, the Colts failed him in a lot of ways. I know Frank Reich said that during his little answer yesterday, and I, I thought that was you know classy of him. He didn't think he was going to be playing with this type of formula here, where hey, we can't run the ball at all, we can't protect you at all. Like he didn't sign up for that. He wasn't thinking that. He was thinking he had the great blue wall in front of him. He was going to be given to Jonathan Taylor, one of the best backs of the game. They had one of the best running games in, the, in football the second half of the season last year. He thought he was going to be protected, play action pass. Okay, I can be accurate and I'm smart and I'll know where to go with the ball. But as we see, if he doesn't have that perfect type of formula there, um, it, it's, it's less than. It is, it is absolutely physically less than. And I think there was some of these signs in training camp in Indianapolis, honestly, where there was, I think, a little bit of a – they tried to say all the right things, but but I know there were some people there that were a little bit like, whoa, man, his arm has no pop in it at all. And, you know, I think they were hopeful that it would just work and everything would go the right way, but, you know, it didn't. And it looks ugly, and, you know, I, I do. I think this, Mike, when you lay it out that way, I think that's probably the last time we see Matt Ryan play football. It reminds me of the Donovan McNabb situation, Minnesota 2011. Remember, he was traded from Philadelphia to Washington in yeah. 2010. Mm -hmm. Then after that season, traded to the Vikings, and the Vikings benched him for Christian Ponder, and they cut him. They just cut him. Now, he asked to be cut, and that's the thing. If Matt Ryan asks to be cut, then then he'll be cut. And if I'm Matt Ryan, I look, you, hey, you're done with me. You don't want me on the field. I understand your business reasons. I understand the $17 million, but – if I'm just not going to play, if I'm not going to be part of this, I just – I don't want to be here. I, I don't see him seamlessly morphing into support, quasi-coach. I don't know. I, I, I think don't it either. all comes down to how he's wired. Like, it, you know, I really want to be part of something. This is my swan song. I'm going to support – Ellinger, I'm going to do my best to make him better. Maybe we we find a way to make chicken salad, and I end up finally getting a Super Bowl ring. I I, doubt, I doubt it though. I think he's going to. There, there's a. It's the same reason that Joe Flacco is the only franchise quarterback that you see hanging around as a backup. These guys that were MVP, highest paid or close to it, the guy. If they're not the guy. They don't want to be there, and yeah, the team they, shouldn't want them. They're egos just, are yeah, big, get me out of made here. enough get money. Me out of here. It's not like the old days in the 80s where like a guy might have been a franchise quarterback and he hangs around too, but you go, well, yeah, he didn't make you know $175 million, so he's going to hang around and collect a backup check for a few years. Okay, that's it, but you're right. Now, there's, there's no point in that. You know, the egos are too big. You've been god of a team and a city forever when you're the franchise quarterback that has success, and yeah, money is – life-changing for generations for your family 
So uh, to, to your point, yeah, I don't know if I see him as that guy that's just going to be on the sideline support system either. Uh, you know, the more, the way you laid it out, I think the things I'm saying and all that, uh, you're right. I, th- I think I could see them parting ways here, you know, at some time over the next few weeks. It's it's crazy. It's crazy it's come to that. It really is. And certainly wouldn't have thought that early in the year. But, man, it's just been bad and some really – the the crazy thing is the bonehead turnovers. I think that's where you just look at it and go – Man, just all the fumbles that they've been fortunate to to recover a good amount of them. And then some of the interceptions are just like, wow, you played too much football. How could you make that happen right there? And I think that that's probably what concerns them more than anything. Nine interceptions, 11 fumbles, eight of the fumbles were recovered by the Colts. And I noticed this in the game against the Broncos that the Colts somehow won. Yeah. I think I said this recently that, so many of his throws look like the old what John Madden would say it's the last shot of a Roman right, candle. Right. Right. Where it just kind of it just kind of pops up in the air and somehow some way is yeah. finding right. open guys. Right. And and look, Matt Ryan has been a great player. He was an MVP in 2016. He did everything in his power to help that team win a Super Bowl. He's been underrated at times. He just passed Dan Marino on the all-time yardage list a week ago. But it's, you know, it's it's a hard truth when it's over, but it's just kind of over. And I agree with you. I don't think we're going to see him again. I think it would take a lot for somebody to say, all right, you know, what are we going to do? Our starter's injured. What are we going to do? They're going to go next man up before yeah. they bring in Matt Ryan. Agreed. Based upon what we've seen on film this yeah. year and try to get him ready and get him in the system and, and try to make it work. You, you've got a backup and a third stringer who are available, who know your offense, who are going to be able to do what you're trying to do. You're going to go with them if that happens. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. Oh, okay. I was going to say, go Mike, ahead. The, go ahead. well, the crazy thing I was going to say, Mike, is, you know, after all of this and all this to talk and all that, you just go where it's crazy, and this all started because of Deshaun Watson, you know, saying that the Atlanta Falcons, he, he's interested in the Atlanta Falcons, and them then flirting back with them, where you go – Man, really, you look at it, you go, Matt Ryan would have been, you know, of course, it's easy to do this now, but the the, the Falcons have more of the formula that to, to, to protect him. So maybe where he wouldn't have quite looked like this right away. Falcons O-line is, is awesome. We see they run the ball on people every week. They're pretty good at protecting, you know, to where it's just ironic where, you know, I think we, we, we thought, hey, he's going to a place that's going to be better for him. And, I, on a, you know, at the end of the day, ended up in a place that really exposed him in a much bigger fashion than maybe if he had stayed in Atlanta. And this wasn't some 3D chess Jedi mind trick by the Falcons. They were keeping him. Remember, they had restructured his contract to bring down a ridiculously high cap yeah, number. Right. They had done that, and they just hadn't filed it. Because under the restructuring, it would have been an even worse cap hit to trade him. The paperwork never got put in because that's when the Deshaun Watson window opened. And that's when the the bridge was burned between Ryan and the Falcons. And it worked out very well for the Falcons to move on when they did. One last thing. Yeah. And I know we got a break. But you mentioned Andrew Luck. Right. And I'm conflicted about this because yeah. I personally believe – that a player has the absolute right to walk away from football whenever, wherever, and however he wants. The moment that you are no longer comfortable suiting up and going out there and playing, if you're not all in, given the physical demands, given the reality of the sport, the intensity, everything, the risk you're taking, if you're not all in, don't do it. Don't do it. However, I mean, the timing couldn't have been worse. That's, that's the perspective it is. Of the Colts. That's real. And – and my God, maybe maybe this is the curse of Andrew Luck. Maybe he put some sort of a curse on them when they booed him off the field. Remember how that happened where somebody leaked it during a preseason game that he was retiring the next day? He gets booed off the field. I mean, the Colts have been lost at sea ever since that Andrew Luck thing. Yes, they made it to the playoffs in 2020 and almost beat the Bills. Yeah, the wild card. Had them on the River. ropes big time. Yeah. But but my goodness, this post Andrew Luck reality for the Colts has just been one disaster after another. A hundred percent. I'm glad you kind of went here because you know I do hear like a lot of the, you know Frank Reich hot seat chatter. You know, and there seems to be could that happen this year? And and listen, I understand it. It's it's the nature of the beast. 
But I, that, it's also one, Mike, where as a guy who follows football, I don't know how you feel about this. I go, man, to your point, that was a major curveball. Not just like, oh, wow, every team's got to deal with something. This is one where a head coach and a GM are out of place because that person's there, right? And you're 2018, right? And also, I just want to, like, 2018 – They go to the playoffs. We're in the divisional game in Kansas City. There's a a, a lot of the NFL world is going, I'm picking the Colts. Tony Dungy, Rodney Harrison, I'm not trying to call them out or anything like that. They took the Colts that day. The Colts had won, like, what, 10 out of the last 11 games of the year that year. They were on fire. So you're thinking, whoa, this team going into 2019 has a chance. 2020, they're extremely good except they have a quarterback that can't throw the ball down the field past 20 yards. That's an issue. Last year was pretty good. So I guess what I'm just trying to say is I'd be careful about just going, oh, wait, it didn't work out that well, and let's abandon Chimp on Frank Reich and Chris Ballard. Uh, I think there's more to it here in this story than, than to just make it that simple. I still think Reich's in danger because I still think Jim Irsay has not gotten over the Carson Wentz thing, the Carson Wentz. Thing. Yeah. Okay. And Frank Reich was the Carson Wentz champion. And right. I won't be surprised because I personally think, I don't know this. This is just my read of the personalities involved. I think Chris Ballard talked Jim Irsay out of fire and Frank Reich last year. That's what I think. Can't prove it. Don't know it. Not reporting it. Just thinking it. And I don't think Ballard is going to be able to save Reich this year. Ursay Ursay is in full blown legacy mode. Oh, Ursay is in full blown gives no f's mode. Whether it's going after Daniel Snyder repeatedly, or whether it's hey I'm taking control of my team, so all bets are off after the season when it comes to Jim Ursay. He's going to do whatever he's going to do, and I think he's emboldened. And I think the praise that he got last year last week, excuse me, for his Snyder comments, I think that's made him, Chris more emboldened to take charge of his team. I think he's really feeling it right now. And I don't, I'm not ready to say he's wrong because I agree with the business decision here. Get Ryan off the field if we got $17 million at risk for next year. Yeah, right. But I think we're going to see a more assertive Jim Irsay mm. going forward. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't doubt what you're saying there. He certainly, you know, doesn't seem to afraid, afraid, you know, here in the last year or two to get involved with these decisions and, and say some things, certainly. And, hey, they're – they're at a crucial point in their their organization's you know history or, or time here as far as just figuring things out for the future and what they want to do. So good for him for taking control. He he certainly you know deserves that owning the football team. He's written a lot of checks over the past ten years that have bounced all over the place with how great this team's going to be and win three Super Bowls in a row and do this and that and the other thing. And I think a lot of it's Carnival Barker where you have to do that to get the fans engaged, but at some point the team has to deliver, and it hasn't. All right, let's take a break. Speaking of teams that haven't delivered, a little blame game for what's going on with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who are back in action on Thursday night against the Ravens. We'll discuss that next on PFT Live, presented by Google Books. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.